Professor Isa Shivji, friends. This is an important seminar on global value chains, on which, however, I do not wish to speak very much. What I would like to say is something which is uh, more general about imperialism and its relationship with third world agriculture. Now, if you look at the metropolitan capitalist countries, capitalist metropolis, capitalist metropolis requires a whole range of goods which it cannot do without, but which it is incapable of producing, and certainly incapable of producing in adequate quantities. As a result, you find that the capitalist metropolis necessarily has to rely on the outside world for the supply of these goods. The Industrial Revolution in Britain was basically around the cotton textiles industry, but Britain never grows any cotton. Britain is incapable of growing any cotton. And consequently, right from that time, not only agricultural raw materials, but even foodstuffs, Britain has had to, Britain, the leading capitalist country, has had to import from the outside world. You know, there was a massive struggle in Britain over the corn laws, which had put high barriers to the imports of corn into Britain. And that massive struggle resulted in a repeal of the corn laws in 1846. And as a result, you find that it is not only mineral products, which have always attracted a fair amount of attention, but even a whole range of agricultural goods which are not producible in the capitalist metropolis but which are required, absolutely required by the capitalist metropolis. Most of these goods are in fact produced in the tropical and semi-tropical regions of the world. And when you look at the a map of the third world countries, almost 80 to 90% of the third world countries really fall within this tropical and semi-tropical regions of the world. As a result, when I say third world agriculture, I have in mind this particular geographical phenomenon, namely that the capitalist metropolis cannot do without a whole range of products of third world agriculture, which it cannot produce itself. It is simply climatically impossible to produce in the frozen soils of the capitalist metropolis these kinds of products. Cotton is an obvious example, beverages, fruits, uh, foodstuffs, and so on. Now, as a result, these goods have to be imported by the capitalist metropolis from these regions, roughly, let us say, from the third world agriculture. Now, the third world agriculture, however, the third world has been peopled by peasantry, by agricultural laborers for a very long time. There is very little fallow land which is available and therefore any increase in third world agriculture must take the form not of an expansion in the net sown area, but must take the form of an increase in the intensity of cropping, an increase in land productivity, something that Santosh Mehrotra was talking about. And this in turn requires what one can call land augmenting technical change or land augmenting practices. In other words, practices that as it were, make one acre produce 
more in which case that one acre has become the equivalent of more than one acre. That's why it's called land augmenting. I think it's a common term in economics, labor augmenting, land augmenting. So it is de facto increase in land area. Practices which actually are land augmenting practices or land augmenting technical change. Therefore, uh, and one such very obvious example of land augmenting technical change, Lord land augmenting practice, is of course irrigation that makes possible multiple cropping. As a matter of fact, the recognition of the significance and importance of irrigation for enlarging output in third world agriculture goes back a very long way. Many of you may remember Marx's famous remark that as a matter of fact most oriental countries had three main ministries. The ministry of war whose concern was to plunder outsiders the Ministry of Revenue, whose concern was to plunder the local peasants or the local insiders, and the Ministry of Irrigation. The importance of irrigation in tropical agriculture, particularly tropical Asian agriculture, has been recognized for a very, very long time. And in fact, you had gigantic irrigation works. Uh, you look at any old Indian dynasty, Firoz Tughlaq is supposed to have built irrigation works, and you can go back further. Now, therefore, you find that the importance of land augmentation, incidentally, a, a, a German former Marxist, German Marxist, who actually became anti-Marxist, called Karl Wittfogel, built up a whole theory of oriental despotism on the basis of this view that actually irrigation was central to oriental agriculture. So the, 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 the fact is that it becomes essential in third world countries for agriculture to rely on land augmenting practices. But land augmenting practices necessarily require the support and the sustenance of the state. Irrigation in, say, Asian conditions is impossible to imagine without the support of the state. Even when you have irrigation through tube wells, the water table in the tube wells depends very much upon whether you have, uh, 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 you know, canal irrigation, whether you have irrigation that is sustained by state efforts. Similarly, agricultural practices have to be made, uh, I mean, ha knowledge of agricultural practices has to be dispersed. And this dispersal requires massive extension services which only the state can provide. Therefore, the adoption of land augmenting practices traditionally and certainly in the contemporary conditions is something which really requires an effort of the state. But at the same time, we come to this peculiar situation where state involvement in increasing production, state involvement in, in fact, uh, carrying out measures relating to the economy directly is something which is frowned upon by metropolitan capital. It's frowned upon by finance capital and it's certainly frowned upon by contemporary international capital. This is a well-known phenomenon. It's a well-known phenomenon whose explanation is not always very clear. In other words, it's very difficult to know why they are so opposed to it, but, but which is obvious. Take, for instance, the fact that in India today, or all over the world, with the exception of the United States, you have legislation that actually prevents the fiscal deficit from being more than 3% of the GDP. Now, you don't have legislation that says that you must spend minimum 3% on health. 
You don't have legislation that says that you must spend 6% on education. You don't have minimum, that, uh, you don't have a legislation that says a certain minimum proportion of GDP should be raised as taxes. But you do have a legislation that actually says that not more than 3% must be at the fiscal deficit. Why? And this is all over. There is absolutely no economic basis for it because of which Professor John Robinson calls this the humbug of finance. That is the kind of humbug that finance spreads. Like in the old days when it said that the budget has to be balanced. Now the budget doesn't have to be balanced but the budget can at best have 3% of GDP as the deficit. So the point is that the, 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 the reason is really not nothing to do with economics. The reason is to do with the nature of capitalism, that fundamentally you find that the legitimacy, the social legitimacy of capitalism arises from the fact that this system is supposed to deliver. If the capitalist system requires the state to continue intervening in its functioning in order to make it operational, effective. In that case, that is uh, an implicit recognition of the illegitimacy of the system. And that is something which capital instinctively realizes, which is why they want the state, of course, to intervene, but through them. In America, when you had the financial crisis, the Obama administration stood guarantee for $13 trillion to save the financial system. So capital is not opposed to state intervention, but it is opposed to state intervention directly, not through the agency of capital itself. Now, because of this, as a matter of fact, you find that the kind of land augmenting technological change and land augmenting practices that are required for growth in third world agriculture are practices which are avoided because they invariably require state intervention. They are avoided in conditions of capitalism. When capitalism becomes dominant, then such measures and such practices get avoided. Now, therefore, we come to a very peculiar position. On the one hand, capital requires these goods. These goods cannot be produced in the metropolis. And therefore, they have to be obtained from the third world agriculture. But on the other hand, the third world agriculture is not allowed to expand. And therefore, how do you obtain these goods without causing inflationary pressures, which of course would be damaging for the entire system? Now, the solution to this is found by curtailing the absorption of what is produced within the third world itself. In other words, you may produce a hundred units. Hundred does not become 105 or 110 or 150 over time. But out of the hundred, whatever was being absorbed within the third world by the working people of the third world is something which now is supposed to be curtailed. If they were absorbing all hundred to start with, in that case, now they are asked to absorb 95 or 85 or 90 or whatever. And as accumulation proceeds, you find that this absorption in the third world of the products that it produces tends to diminish. Now, among these products, whether directly or indirectly, food drains is a very important component. You know, by, by directly or indirectly, what I mean is that the advanced countries may not require our food drains. They may not require third world food drinks. They did in the 19th century, but today they may not require third world food drinks. But on the other hand, if they require other goods, then land has to be diverted to the production of these other goods, because of which less food drinks has to be available, because of which if inflation is to be avoided, absorption of food drinks inside the third world countries must of course be squeezed. And if that is the case, then you find that there has to be a decline in per capita absorption of food drains within the third world over time. Now, this is a very important motivation, very important motive for 
imperialism. In fact, imperialism, in other words, is really concerned with imposing a squeeze on the absorption of a whole range of products within the third world so that more of it is made available for metropolitan use. Since with capital accumulation, the demand for such products keeps increasing, the squeeze has to be intensified, which is another way how the proposition which Marx had put forward in capital, namely that capital accumulation produces wealth at one pole and poverty at another, is a proposition that is vindicated because obviously while capital accumulation obviously enlarges the capital stock and therefore produces that one wealth at one pole, you find that it must be accompanied by the fact that since you have a given amount of land within the third world, this land produces a certain amount of output. This output has to be, is, is a part of this output, growing part of this output is required for capital accumulation, which creates larger demand for this output over time. Less and less must be available inside because of which the absorption of this output in the third world must keep decreasing. And if it decreases, then it produces poverty in the other pole. So the development of wealth at one pole and poverty at another is something which, to my mind, one very important way that this happens, this is not the way that Marx talked about, but one very important way that this happens is, of course, because of the demand of capitalist metropolis on third world agriculture. Now, this is something, I mean, his, okay, let me just go a little into the history. You know very well that historically the reduction in absorption of food grains within third world agriculture, within Indian agriculture, we know Indian data very well, was something which was quite drastic. At the beginning of the 20th century, 20th, 20th, yes, 20th. At the beginning of the 20th century, you had, for instance, roughly speaking, in what was then called British India, per capita annual availability of food grains, which was roughly about 200 kilograms. Okay. Then it declined quite sharply. By the way, I, from, I begin from the beginning of the 20th century because we have data from that. Okay. It declined quite sharply so that by the time of independence it had really collapsed to 138 kilograms, which is very low. But even if you believe that those were exceptional years, certainly you find that it was less than 150 kilograms. And these are quinquennial averages, so 146 kilograms. Uh, so, so, so you find, in other words, keeping 47 out, if you take the quinquennial average for the preceding five years, then you find that it was about 146 kilograms. So, so from 200 kilograms to 100 and to less than 150 kilograms, drastic decline in per capita availability of food grains in India and also in other places like Java, for instance, which was a Dutch colony and so on. I mean, you, you find that this is something which has happened all over the colonial world. Similarly, Japanese imperialism squeezed the Korean peasantry because Japan brought its 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 imports of, of, of agri agricultural materials from Korea which was its colony and therefore you found a decline taking place there as well whatever data we have uh, invariably show such a decline taking place uh, because of the operations of imperialism on the third world agriculture in the post-independence period, the post-independence <laughs> period was one in which, which actually represents in many ways a weakening of the operations of imperialism. Of course, in third world countries, decolonization meant we had an independent government. But even within the first world countries, you know, Keynesian demand management policies were introduced, uh, which finance capital did not want. As a matter of fact, before the first, before the second world war, the Great Depression had continued. 
And even though Keynes wrote in 1936, the general theory of employment, interest and money, nobody took any notice of the book or nobody really bothered very much about implementing Keynesian ideas. Roosevelt did in his New Deal, but on the other hand, in the moment the New Deal had succeeded in raising employment a little bit, again Roosevelt was persuaded to cut back on his expansionary programs because of which once more you had a crisis in America in 1937. Really, before the Second World War, there was no respite from the Great Depression, the huge unemployment that the Depression generated. So, the point is that this was therefore a period in which there was a weakening of finance and the weakening of finance once more resulted in uh, uh, the introduction of Keynesian demand management policies even in the advanced countries in the United States through larger military expenditures and in Europe generally through social democratic policies of welfare state. So, the, the post-Second World War period was a peculiar situation, a peculiar conjuncture in which both in the First World and in the Third World there was a weakening in the power of finance capital. And as a result you found that in the First World, of course, through state uh, intervention in demand management you had high rates of growth. And in the Third World, because you had all kinds of new independent governments coming up, those independent governments actually pursued land augmenting policies and practices. You actually found that there was a, a, a change, a change and alteration in the downward trend in per capita food grain availability because of which it actually increased and it reached approximately about 180 kilograms before neoliberal policies were introduced in India. After neoliberal policies being introduced you once more find a decline, uh, you know, I mean a plateau, then a decline, then a slight increase, but no no secular increase in per capita food availability in India. Uh, therefore, you find that the weakening of imperialism, in the sense the weakening of the hold of finance capital, both in the first world and in the third world, which is generally associated with the golden age of capitalism, was one during which land augmenting practices actually were introduced in many third world countries. We know in India they were introduced, there were huge irrigation projects and so on. And at the same time, uh, with the reassertion of the power of finance capital, which is now globalized finance capital, which arises from the late 60s in Europe, 70s in particular, and of course in India it, arise, it arrives a little late, 80s in Africa and Latin America, in India it arises only at the beginning of the 90s, but with the reassertion of the power of finance, which now is globalized, globalized finance capital, or if you like international finance capital, now there is once more an effort to impose a squeeze on the absorption of goods of tropical and semi-tropical agriculture on the working people of the third world. Okay. So once more you have the reassertion of or reimposition of this squeeze which had to some extent been alleviated in the period when you had various dirigious development uh, regimes in third world countries. Now the mechanism, of course if you want to look at the specific ways in which this actually comes about, uh, the, the post-war state interventionist regimes in the first world for instance solve the problem of the market in other words you know i mean taking another trajectory you found that the third world countries had provided not just these raw materials but also had provided a source of external markets this source of external markets was by deindustrializing the local artisans this naturally gets exhausted at a certain point and this exhaustion 
is to my mind a very important reason for the Great Depression of the 1930s, which is not recognized. You look at any book on economics, there will be all kinds of factors explaining why there was a Great Depression, but not one book would talk about the fact that there was an exhaustion of the colonial and semi-colonial markets, which had provided a big boost to capitalism in the period up to the First World War. The fact that interwar years meant an end to that kind of market or end to an expansion based on external markets of that kind, to my mind, played a very important role in the Great Depression of the 1930s. Now, post-war, post-Second World War, state intervention in demand management actually resolve the market problem for advanced capitalism. Because, okay, you didn't have third world market, but so what? You actually now have the state providing the market. Okay, Kaleski talks of it in terms of an export surplus by the capitalist sector to the state. When the state finances its expenditures by a fiscal deficit that is analogous to an export surplus undertaken by the capitalist sector to the state. So this was a lovely arrangement in which they can actually, the state can be manipulated to provide the appropriate export surplus that would absorb all the goods and therefore get rid of the problems of insufficient demand. Actually Rosa Luxemburg had talk about, talked about how it becomes a good manipulable way of really capitalism resolving its market problems. But the post-war Keynesian arrangement in the advanced countries did not have a way of resolving the raw materials problem, resolving the other problem which I was talking about of getting tropical and semi-tropical agricultural raw materials because of which you actually had of course, for, for, for some time it didn't matter because the newly independent countries in the third world wanted to industrialize. To industrialize, they needed to import a whole range of goods, including capital goods and machinery and so on. To pay for that kind of import, they had to export whatever they were producing on which they were already engaged in the, pre, in the colonial period and therefore they made desperate efforts to push out agricultural exports while undertaking the land augmenting practices. Agricultural output expanded and of course based on agricultural output there was an effort to push out exports and because of that you actually found that there was no real problem as far as the the, 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 the raw material side was concerned. Many, many economists like Arthur Lewis, for instance, uh, had actually predicted at the time of the Second World War that there is going to be a big inflation because you won't have enough supplies or raw materials to the advanced capitalist countries. But as a matter of fact, there was very little inflation for a very long period of time. But of course, this inflation then takes off in the late 60s. This inflation takes off in the late 60s and it is, it is resolved initially by creating a deflationary, creating contractionary, I'm pursuing contractionary fiscal and monetary policies domestically, but ultimately it actually gives rise to a new regime of hegemony of international finance capital, which we call globalization and marked by neoliberal policies. The, 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 the regime in which we live today is a regime of globalization in which capital finance is free, capital including finance is free to move around all over the globe as well as commodities more or less free to uh, move around all over the globe and at the same time you actually find that it represents the hegemony of international finance capital and the pursuit of neoliberal economic policies, including privatization of public sector units and so on. Everybody knows what the neoliberal policies are. The, the regime of neoliberal globalization provides, as it were, a way out of the raw material problem that I was talking about. It, 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 it entails a reassertion of imperialism and therefore imperialist hegemony over the third world agriculture. 
How does it do that? There are at least six different ways in which now you find that the domestic absorption of goods produced by third world agriculture by the working people of the third world is actually squeezed. The first, the most obvious way that it can happen is of course through terms of trade movements. Obviously if it is the case that you find that the prices which the peasant receive are lowered relative to the prices for manufactured goods, then to buy whatever manufactured goods they do require, they will have to curtail their absorption of the goods that they were absorbing earlier, out even out of a given output. Therefore, term curtailing the absorption of these goods. But then that is something which does not necessarily have to be there. In other words, terms of trade is one possible way, but not the only possible way. If it is not the only possible way, what's the other possible way? The other possible way which colonialism used throughout hundreds of years in India was through the colonial tax system. That you actually found that taxation of the peasantry basically meant physically taking over. In other words, corresponding to the money raised by taxes, you actually found physical goods which were taken over from the peasantry and these physical goods were then exported without any quid pro quo. In other words, they were simply taken over. The tax money was, was, was simply absorbed by the metropolitan power. So not only did it reduce absorption domestically of those goods, but what is more, it actually made those goods available free completely gratis to the advanced capitalist world. This was called the drain of wealth by the Indian nationalist writers. Dada Bhai Noroji uh, talked about it and, 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 and so on. And in fact, Dada Bhai Noroji not only talked about it, but Dada Bhai Noroji must have in some indirect way got this idea of drain explained to Karl Marx as well who in one of his letters actually talks about it, what the British take from India without any quid pro quo, according to Marx, amounts to the incomes, the total annual incomes of 60 million agricultural industrial workers in India. That's the magnitude of the dream. Anyhow, so, so, so taxation is obviously one very important way in which you can keep down domestic absorption. Whether this tax revenue is spent internally or externally, it provides one way in which you can keep down domestic absorption. The third way is when you see the peasantry produce... I, I, I should make one point clear. I said that there has to be a suppression of the domestic absorption of these goods by the working people. Now, working people is a lot more than peasantry. Working people means urban workers, agricultural laborers everywhere. But the living standards of the working people as a whole and the living standards of the peasantry are very closely correlated. You found, for instance, colonial deindustrialization, which actually threw out the artisans, threw out the weavers, actually produced a reduction in the peasants' living standards over a period of time because the weavers who were thrown out came and uh, tried to, you know, set up in agriculture, their demand for land increased, they had nothing else to do, and therefore wages fell, rents increased, as Professor Bipin Chandra of our own university has shown. Uh, this, by the way, has a, is, is, is of great interest, because if you remember Tagore's uh, novel, Ghore Bairi, the argument there is that the peasants become better off by using imported cloth compared to the coarse cloth which are woven, which is woven by the local weavers. Therefore, the suggestion, the, the way Tagore saw the issue is that this is something which causes deindustrialization. It hurts the artisans, 
but on the other hand, it improves the living standards of the peasantry. And if you remember, he opposed the Swadeshi movement on the grounds that this is really going to be anti-peasant, which in the context of Bengal, since the peasants were predominantly Muslims, would actually give rise to communal problems. Very insightful of him to have seen the communal problems, but on the other hand, the analysis is, is, is incomplete because the peasants who are thrown out actually give rise to a reduction in the living standards. Sorry, the artisans thrown out give rise to a reduction in the living standards of the uh, laborers and, and, and the peasants. Likewise, when you see today, you find that the peasantry is in a bad way because of which 15 million peasants over the last 20, between 1991 census and 2011 census have stopped being cultivators. Some of them may have become agricultural laborers, others have, others have migrated abroad. And that in turn swells the reserve army of labor and reduces the living standards of the urban workers as well as, I mean, both the, the, the uh, urban workers, including the urban organized workers. So I talked about a reduction in absorption of the working people but on the other hand, a reduction in the absorption of the peasantry itself is, as it were, a clue to the reduction in absorption of the working people. It gives an indication of the reduction in absorption of the working people. And therefore, the imposition of a squeeze on the peasantry is a means of making goods available for the metropolitan, for, for, for the capitalist metropolis. So, to come back to the argument, terms of trade is one way, taxes is another way, and the third way is, of course, the peasantry consumes a whole lot of goods. It doesn't consume only the goods that it produces, it also consumes a whole lot of other goods. If you raise the prices of those goods, then of course the peasant should be forced to consume less of the goods it produces in order to be able to afford uh, the, the, the other goods it, 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 it consumes at the higher prices. Now, two such things which come about is through the privatization of education and health services. Neoliberal capitalism entails the privatization of education and health, and of course the privatization of education and health is something which is a very big burden on the peasantry. Privatization of health, we know, is an enormous strain on the peasantry. A large number of peasant suicides which have taken place in India is because the peasants get into debt for health-related reasons. I should say that, you know, I, I, I worked in Kerala for five years and we wanted to bring in a debt relief bill in, in, in the assembly that the state government should help the peasants pay off their debt. And one of the issues which was raised in the assembly by large numbers of speakers was that, look, most of these debts are for non-agricultural purposes. They are debts which arise because somebody fell ill and therefore the peasant had to go and, 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 and borrow. Therefore, how can we write off non-agricultural debt because it is something which is not nothing to do with agriculture? As a matter of fact, within the peasant's economy, there is this distinction between productive and, 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 and pr productive debt and consumption debt it really doesn't exist that if you find that there is privatization of education and health, which raises enormously the price of these services that the peasant has to, has to obtain, then of course that has an impact in terms of a reduction in its consumption or absorption of its own products. So that is one very, very significant way, which I believe is also the reason why all consumer price indices in India are really inadequate, because they don't take into account the effects of privatization of these services. The fourth thing is, of course, uh, fiscal, uh, I mean, you know, Fiscal austerity, let us say. Fiscal austerity, which basically means that there is a reduction in subsidies. I think Santosh was talking about it. You see, a reduction in subsidies, like an, a, a, a rise in taxes, essentially gives rise to a reduction in the profitability of agriculture. It gives rise to a reduction in the share of the output 
which accrues to the peasant from what he produces. Okay, So a reduction in subsidies, which has been very common in India, and the latest budget, for instance, there's a massive reduction in food subsidy. This reduction in subsidy, by the way, you may say, why does a cut in food subsidy affect the peasantry? Because if you cut the food subsidy, in that case, you would have to curtail the procurement price or, or you know, keep the procurement price steady because if you raise the procurement price and curtail the food subsidy, then, then, then you can't provide food at subsidized prices to the urban consumers. So a curtailment of food subsidy is really a signal for keeping the procurement prices restricted. So a curtailment of subsidies is one very important way in which you find that there is a squeeze on the peasantry. The fifth way that there is a squeeze on the peasantry is for instance, if you have a curtailment of employment, you see, suppose, suppose you have uh, the state pursuing austerity. You have a curtailment of demand in the economy, therefore a curtailment of employment. And if there's a curtailment of employment, then you have large food grain stocks lying around with the Food Corporation of India, because of which you find that there is even out of a given output, there is more available for possible export to the metropolis, or if you don't export that directly to the metropolis in that particular physical form, then it becomes possible to shift land away from those crops to other crops which are demanded. So these are various ways in which there has been a very substantial squeeze on the peasantry. Let me just give you a couple of, 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 of kind of, you know, figures that if you look, for instance, at per capita food grains output. Now, per capita food grains output was increasing, but per capita food grains output in India between 1991, when you had the uh, neoliberal economic policies being pursued, and the latest period, per capita food grain output, while during this period it may have gone down and up and so on, has not really increased, taking the beginning and the end point. While per capita food grain output has not increased, you would have found that we talk about 8% growth rate in India, this large growth rate and so on. You find that but for about half a dozen years, in every remaining year, the stocks of food grains with the government have been abnormally high. In other words, have been larger than what is considered normal for that pe period of the year. So despite there being no increase in per capita food grain output, no increase, you find that there are substantial stocks lying around, which is true even today. You may have seen that the consumption data, which the government of India has not released, NSS consumption expenditure data, show that between 2000 11, 12, and 2017, 18, there is a fall in real per capita consumption expenditure in rural India by 8%, which is an amazingly high figure. But at the same time, there are plenty of food grain stocks around. Okay, uh, this is something which is which is also reflected in the poverty figures, because most of the poverty figures we come across are, 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 are figures which are really totally unreliable because poverty, you just define poverty in terms of a certain nutritional norm. That was the way originally it was defined, namely 2,200 calories per person per day in rural India and 2,100 calories per person per day in urban India. You look at proportion of people below 2,200 calories per person per day, then you find that in 1993-4, and I'm using that because that was the first large, large sample NSS survey in India after liberalization began. The proportion of people below that was about 58% in rural India. 
58% of the rural population did not have access to 2,200 calories per person per day. If you look at the proportion in 2011-12, which is supposed to be a good year, because Many of you may not know that 2009-10 is when the NSS survey should have occurred. It did occur. And it showed an enormous increase in poverty. Then everybody said, no, 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 this is a very bad harvest year. Let's have another survey. So they had another survey in 2011-12. And that showed that 68% of rural India was below 2,200 calories per person per day. So nutritionally, you certainly find that there is reduced absorption as far as rural India is concerned, and I would therefore more generally say as far as the working people are concerned in, uh, in terms of the food intake, the food drain intake. And that, as I said, is a direct consequence of the neoliberal economic policies which reinforce or, or, or you know, which, which, which resurrect the imperial uh, arrangement whereby there has to be a curtailment of domestic absorption of agricultural goods in tropical and semi-tropical agriculture in order to make it available uh, for the requirements of, of the metropolis. The last mechanism through which such a redu reduction occurs is of course through the and this would be directly useful to you when you're looking at value chains and so on. The, if, you, if you look at a complete value chain from the beginning right up to the final retail good, and you find out what is the proportion of this total value that is that accrues to the peasants, by peasants I mean peasants and agricultural laborers and so on, that accrues to the peasants, then you'd find that this proportion has been shrinking. Now, it has been shrinking because of Kaliskian reasons that, okay, the markup rises over time, but it has been also shrinking because of a very simple arrangement, namely that in periods in which there is an excess production in these sectors, you find that the peasants' prices fall, the retail prices don't fall. On the other hand, the moment the opposite happens, you find that if the peasants' prices rise, the retail prices also rise. So you find an enlargement of the margin accruing, accruing to the sectors other than the peasants in glut years, but no reduction in this margin in the scarcity years. Very simple example, you know, in, in, in Kerala, for instance, coffee producers were really badly hit by excess production of coffee in, 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 in certain periods. But on the other hand, if you went to the market and you bought Nescafe, there was no reduction in the price of Nescafe. The retail price of the processed good did not fall, but on the other hand, there was a fall in water crews to the peasants. Now, this is something which, which, which occurs over time. There's a kind of asymmetry. And because of, uh, this asymmetry was referred to by Nicholas Caldo, the Cambridge economist, many years ago. And this asymmetry is something that actually causes a secular increase or a secular decrease in the share of the peasants in, 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 in this value chain. And that is another way in which there is uh, in which there is a kind of you know, squeeze on the peasantry. Now, the squeeze on the peasantry is not just confined to India. It is a global phenomenon. I, I'm more familiar with Indian data, which is why I'm referring to Indian data. But just one illustrative global figure which I want to give you. If you look at the per capita serial output in the world as a whole, per capita serial output, you take a triennium around 1980. You find the average per capita serial output for the triennium was 355 kilograms that time. You take a triennium, similarly, around 2000, it comes down to 343 kilograms. And if you take a triennium around 215, then it, it, it's again about 344 kilograms. In other words, it's lower than what it was in 1980. 
Now, obviously, you're not importing food grains from the moon, and as a result, the decline in per capita food grain output must be manifesting itself in terms of a decline in per capita food grain absorption. Now, imagine this is a period in which the world economy has grown. Elasticity of income elasticity of demand for food grains is obviously positive. And if that is the case, then you should have expected some increase taking place in the demand for food grains. And therefore, if inflationary pressures have to be avoided, and there have been no secular inflationary pressures, some increase should have taken place in the supply of food grains. But no such increase has taken place. On the contrary, you have a decline in the per capita availability, per, per, per capita output of food grains, and therefore one can infer in the per capita availability of food grains. And this therefore must entail that there has been a income distribution shift against the peasantry, that this 8% or, or whatever growth rate, 8% in India, whatever growth rate elsewhere, is a growth rate that has actually left large sections of the population, in particular the peasant population, peasants, agricultural laborers, artisans, and so on, the working people, their incomes, relatively speaking, unchanged. Now, what I'm saying has a number of very important implications. One implication, which is pretty obvious, is the following. One implication is for unemployment. That, you know, we say, for instance, that there's a lot of unemployment. As you know, at the moment, the unemployment rate in India is higher than it has been over the last half century. And when that is the case, when this is pointed out, most people would say, well, it is because the growth rate has slowed down. Let's have a higher growth rate. And if you have a higher growth rate, there would. But all this, of course, I know, is not exactly on the topic that you are going to be discussing. But I just thought, that I should bring this to your notice. In other words, there is, a, there is a direction that agriculture takes because it is subject to the hegemony of international finance capital. It is actually the direction that imperialism imposes on tropical or semi-tropical agriculture. That direction is actually one that accentuates poverty that accentuates malnutrition. But on the other hand, if we are going to move out of that direction in the way that I have been suggesting, then we would also have to get out of the hegemony of imperialism. Thank you.